let's carry on then. Um, and I don't think we're expecting anybody else, are we? Maybe it's it's become a small group. Yeah. <laughs> there were so many people that first day. I was like, man, there's like 30 something people in the book club. And then it's it's dwindled down to like the four of us, occasionally a fifth person. <laughs> so well, that's kind of why I thought we ought to meet today, because yeah. otherwise I think my my enthusiasm might flag also. I'm I'm kind of interested in you know, the Bayesian statistics, but it's really unlikely that I will ever use any of this because I'm just not involved in the kind of social science research where this multi-level modeling seems to be useful. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how much I will be using it either. I know like in medicine and like certain kinds of social science research, it is very applicable. I'm not so sure as much with time series. I, I, I'm guessing there is a way, but I haven't seen all the models I've seen until now in cross-sectional data, so. Yeah. Who knows? Well, that means that I'm gonna to have to use it all the time to make up for <laughs> <laughs> to make up for you two. Okay. <laughs> um, but I'm actually gonna put something in the chat sure. that will be relevant for uh, Laura's concern. Oh, for Kent. There you go. Uh, That's really relevant. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Now. Very cool. So there you go. But uh, and then uh, for Kent, uh, you know, Mick Elrith, he's actually not a social scientist. So mm -hmm. he's anthropologist. Isn't he like evolutionary anthropologist or what else does yeah. he do? Biology, he does maybe a, as well? Yeah, he does like a lot of evolution. Like his book, his substantive book was like modeling evolution. Cool. Huh. Although maybe it is social evolution. So 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 maybe so maybe he is. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to make everyone excited. That's honestly what I'm, my goal is. <laughs> well, maybe I need to head on over to the Bayesian time series. Uh, you know, I I feel like there's a few people if I pulled that out of my back pocket, I'm going to do some bait. Would be very impressed, even though they probably have no idea what I was doing. <laughs> so. All right. Well, should we should we start with the easy problems? Sure. Uh, which ones did you do, Justin? I know you said you did pretty much exactly the same ones that I did, so I don't want to. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I, I'm looking at this. It's kind of a, a kind of a, a mess. I like just looking at my R markdown, but definitely the first easy ones, you know. And I even made some comments on easy six and easy seven, which are ones where we're supposed to draw stuff. I actually did not do easy six and easy seven. I was like, nah, I'm not drawing anything. <laughs> so I just oh, I didn't even see that there was an easy seven because it's not in the PDF. Oh, that's so weird. I, I wonder about that. Well, the, yeah, the PDF is older. Oh, I see. Sketch, yeah. No, I didn't, didn't sketch. I just sort of said, what's good about it? Yeah, 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 that's what I did. Or bad about it. By the way, I thought I'd just show you this. this there's a... Does this exist in the United States? Um, this is very relevant to our current oh, discussion. Oh, a sucre, um, what does it say? Without sugar. Oh, Coca-Cola sin a sucre. But nice. uh, it's a pretty interesting 8-bit styled Yeah, I don't can. haven't seen that. Usually these things. things hit the US first. So that's Coke why was... Zero probably is the equivalent here, no sugar. It's definitely sugar-free Diet Coke, but I've had not in that packaging. Yeah, what I don't that? drink. I don't drink soda, so yeah, I, I don't really, I'm not up on that. I am, I only drink soda when it has like a interesting, anyway, we should talk about base. Um, <laughs> only when it has a cool can, huh? That is actually what I was gonna say. Okay. Um, um, so, but I guess we can just talk about it. Like, I don't know. Sure. Yeah, I think Lord, just your, talking your screen really probably easy, looks better. <laughs> Okay, if you think my screen looks better, I mean, I'm happy to share it, but I, uh, I don't know that it, uh, I'll share it, and then we can just use it as a guide. So. Okay. And I apologize ahead of time if my internet connection gets a little bit weird. I think my husband is on a 
video call, which means when both of us are on, it always mm. gets, you never know. <laughs> um, only so much broad, uh, bandwidth, I guess. Okay, so question E1, pretty self-explanatory. I kind of think of these easy questions. It's like, if you're getting ready to do like some hill sprints or something, you know, you're going to be doing some walking lunges first, just kind of get those, yeah, you know, we'll just kind of warm up, to warm up, sure like kind of like, oh yeah, this is what I just read or whatever. So which of the following is the requirement of a simple metropolis algorithm? The well, three options are parameters must be discrete, likelihood of function must be Gaussian, proposal distribution must be symmetric. So just looking at the book, I chose three. Any, uh, any other opinions about that? No. Okay, it's <laughs> pretty explanatory. Uh, question two, Gibbs sampling is more effect efficient than the Metropolis algorithm. How does it achieve this extra efficiency? Are there any limitations to the Gibbs sampling strategy? So I put, it allows for asymmetry of the proposal distribution. This allows for more efficient, AKA fewer steps exploration of the posterior. Limitations are the necessity of using conjugate prior, priors, which is basically certain pairs, combos of prior and likelihoods. And the fact that as the model complexity increases, the sampling strategy becomes very efficient, tends to get stuck, so to speak, in certain regions of the posterior. Any other ways of phrasing that that y'all have? Yeah, I just said that the, um, the proposals were accepted more often, which is what makes it more efficient, but just kind of a different way of putting that. Yeah. Mm. I did, I don't, so it's been a while since I read this. I do remember him saying that for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, that it has an acceptance rate of uh, basically 100%. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. I do remember that too. High, yeah. Uh, but I don't remember, is that, does that apply to, to Gibbs as well? I remember that there was I, more. That's of, a good question. I don't remember either. <laughs> No, I don't think so. It just they're accepted more often is what I wrote down. I haven't I haven't looked at this in a while, but that's probably right from the book. Okay. Let me grab my book real quick and uh... yeah, he had, I, there's an example of of Gibbs sampling. I oh, know it's Metropolis. Let's see. Yeah, there's one comment on figure 9.3, um, which is on page 269, uh, where, where the very last sentence in the description of the figure is, in higher dimensions, it is yeah. impossible, essentially impossible to tune Metropolis or Gibbs to be efficient, which I would imagine means that a lot of rejections happen. But, it, you know. I think it's, you're doing one of either one of these trade-offs is a fail. If your step size is too is small, you get accepted proposals, but you just don't explore the space. And if your step size is big enough to explore the space, you get so many rejections that you don't actually get anywhere. Yeah. I want to, uh, and I'm just looking at this. I remember this, uh, when I read it, the concentration of measure section, which is pretty small, uh, kind of, I think that was conceptually the part where I had to read the slowest. Where's that? It's, oh, yeah. it, it's, it's the same. So it starts on the page uh, prior, so 268. And it's, when I say section, uh, it's not a formal section. There's not like a, it's really all of the high, I guess it's really the high dimensional problems section, right. which is 9.2.2. .2. But he starts talking about constant, he does some like simulations to show specifically yeah. this concentration of measure. And I just remember, like, man. Yeah, high uh, dimensional problems really break your intuition. Mm -hmm. That, you know, most of the, most of the um, volume in a high dimensional space is at the surface. And that's sort of related to the, this, the, this concentration of measure is, is different, but it's another weird property, property of high dimensional space. Yeah, I, I wish a problem, he had put a problem about that. Uh, so I, I can't say that I've integrated it into my brain, that intuition. My intuitions are still defective. Yeah. Novice on that. Yeah, but, same here. 
But okay, so that was nine E two. Yeah, E three scrolling down. <clears throat> Which sort of parameters can ha Hamilton Monte uh, Carlo not handle? Explain why. So HMC requires continuous parameters. This method is built on a glide path method, so to speak, where the particle, and they said that's actually a really good analogy of like what is going on, could stop at any theoretical value. Obviously, if that is the case, that would not be reasonable if you have discrete parameter values. Yeah, it would fall through a hole in your Hamiltonian <laughs> surface. Yep, exactly. So. Okay, and then E4 is explain the difference between the number of effective samples as counted by Stan and the number of samples. The number of samples is just about how many samples were taken. The number of effective samples is the number of samples that were independent, so they were useful for parameter estimation, right? Not autocorrelated. Now, I put the exclamation point in there because this is getting my mind around this. This can be higher than the number of samples and Stan is skilled enough to produce anti-correlated samples. So, I get the idea of yeah. no correlation, anti-correlated. I mean, I get the idea of inverse correlation, which is a different, obviously the opposite side of the coin of, of you know, positive autocorrelation. Anti-correlated, if anybody has like a, a mental image that would allow one to kind of wrap their mind around that, I would love to hear it. No, I, I don't know. That, that was definitely, that should be in the third edition. I hope he puts an overthinking box for anti-correlated yeah for anti-correlated yeah i almost feel like it's like an article of faith like you know what i mean where it's like anti-correlated anti-correlation exists some magic person named stan knows how to do it i must accept it on yeah. faith. Yeah, <laughs> i mean yeah. at the risk of being uh flippant i don't mean to denigrate any you know any uh faith-based things but yeah that's that's <laughs> where i'm at right now <laughs> with this I wonder, does it mean negatively correlated? I'm just thinking about a um, autocorrelation plot where you look at yeah, and that's like what like in a Markov see, chain. Typically, you'll have correlation between adjacent ones, and so if you plot correlation of x with x lag one, you get some, a positive number, or maybe yeah. it actually gives a negative number. You know, I wondered about that, but then. Here's the thing is that a negative autocorrelation is still an autocorrelation in my mind, at least the way, now this might be different than if the coefficient is positive, right? But there's still some association, even if it is an inverse one. Um, yeah. So that makes me think anti-correlated is something, some mis mysterious stand tenant that um, I have yet to, <laughs> to understand, but maybe it is as simple as inverse correlation. I don't know. It's it's a bit mysterious for sure. Yeah, but I feel like though, so I just did a Google search on anti-correlation and at least like the top top line, I mean, just like dictionaries define it as basically negative correlation. Oh, okay. Well, then why are they just, I, that that's interesting. Cause then I'm just like, okay, negative correlation is, yeah, I mean, I'm still wrapping my mind. Cause like you could have like an ARIMA model or like, you know, just for, that's a standard like auto model built on auto correlated auto correlation in a variable and the parameter can be even if like an ar1 can be negative and you would still be able to build like an, an auto regressive model i would still say that's correlated so i don't know maybe it's just yeah, a it's, he says you can think of nf as the length of a markov chain with no auto correlation that would provide the same quality of estimate as your chain so that's, I mean, I don't know how you compute that, but it, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a definition that doesn't require understanding anti-correlation. Well, the next sentence is that NF can be larger than the length of the chain providing sequential samples are anti-correlated in the right way. So it, yeah, yeah, it's kind of mysterious. Um, I just said that it's the estimate of the equivalent number of uncorrelated samples that would give equally good estimates of the parameter space. Um, somehow. I, 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 that's an interesting way to phrase it, yeah. That's basically right out of the book. <laughs> Pretty close, but it's made sense to me, at least. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, well I, I have one more for the, um, this is pretty standard, right? Which value of R, which value should R hat approach when a chain is sampling posterior dis distribution correctly? And then it should approach the value of one from, from above or values greater than one. So, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, just real quick though. Um, so I wonder, do you think that there's a slight typo in that question and that it should be when chains are sampling correctly because um, to get an R hat, you have to have more than one chain. Mm -hmm. And uh, because R hat looks at whether or not the chains have converged because mm -hmm. it's a measure of yeah. the relationship between the variance of one chain to the variance like within a chain, it's kind of, I mean, I actually don't know oh. if it's calculated anything like ANOVA, but it's looking at the difference between within chain variance to between mm -hmm. chain variance to look at, uh -huh, to look at that. And, and I'm pretty sure that when I, no matter how many chains you run, you'll get one R hat value. So it's not like each chain has an R hat value. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I, I think it, Maybe, maybe it just means like a theoretical chain is sampling the posterior distribution because maybe the lack of convergence, right, would be indicative that one or more chains are not sampling the posterior distribution correctly. I don't know. I don't feel like I have a good enough understanding of, of this to kind of differentiate the various ways that could be, that it could be expressed. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, well, we can, we can leave it there, but it is one, one from above. That is, that is what the book says. So that is what I believe. <laughs> the Bayes tenets, right? We can start our own religion now. Um, or more like Monte Carlo tenets. Okay, so Justin, do you, I know you did the six and seven uh, problems. Do you want me to stop sharing if you want to share no, no, no. So I, I didn't mean that I, I did them. So it asks you, uh, it asks us, it asks of the reader to draw them. I just comment. I think I did exactly what Kent said he did, uh, which is just saying, like, I'm not going to get out pen and paper, but I'll tell you what the thing would look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I can just do those real quick. I mean, sure. So, and I hope they do mean real quick. So six is asking us to sketch out what a good trace plot, plot would look like. Uh, so, which what does that mean? It means one that effectively samples from the posterior. Um, and so, basically, a good trace plot. So, the trace plot is the history, basically. So, the x axis is like time, or yeah, we can think of it as time. And the, the y axis is the, the parameter value. And uh, so, it should just look like it has a stable, basically, it has a stable mean. And it has, uh, if you were to do like a, uh, what is that? If you, if you were to, if you were to chug it through, put it through some ARIMA machinery, you'd get like a, what would it be? A zero, zero, zero process. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I, asked, I just phrase it that way. Cause I know that we have a time series expert in the group. Uh, <laughs> Not sure, sure. I'd say that. <laughs> but yeah, but basically when what it should not look like is uh, like a, a random walk. It shouldn't like wander around and have different means depending on like which frame you're looking at. So, yeah. so yeah. And then so, and like the, the, the keywords there are stationarity, good mixing, which I find that good mixing to be a, a kind of weird name, but by that he means explores the posterior space thoroughly and uh, convergence, which is something for which you need multiple uh, chains to check. Yeah, and I kind of had the idea, like I've looked at some plots before, because we, we've been doing this, if you use the BRMS package, we've been doing this kind of Monte Carlo stuff for uh, a while, right? Because, it's, um, and when the chains don't converge, I kind of think of it as, I don't know if this is right, but, the, the posteriors that like are being, like there's different, the, the chains are not coming up with the same answer in the long run of the posterior distribution. So the, either the samples that are taken are not effective, the number is too low, whatever else. And so you, you can't really, you don't have a good solid answer on like 
what what do these chains all what is the consensus i guess uh not it's very untechnical language but that's kind of how i think about it <laughs> yeah yeah definitely no consensus which does mean no convergence yeah. i like that the personalized yeah. chains <laughs> anthropomorphizing right so yeah. it's always a good idea not anthropomorphic chains um and then just the the I, I really like the word I don't know if I like the word but for, it's an interesting one for a trace rank plot calling them trank plots yes I've thinking the same thing <laughs> um that one was like an interesting whoever came up with that I thought was pretty pretty clever um Not also the actually entirely sure I understand it I mean I I get what it's supposed to look like, but the construction of it, um, I guess I'm really not sure. It's a histogram of something. It's actually, for each trace, it's a histogram of where it's ranked in each bin. So, so the way I, the way I, I'm pretty sure it is, and I, I did reread this part yesterday, so I'm a bit more confident on this than probably any other thing I've said today, uh, unless I introduce myself at some point, um, would be that you, so say we sample four chains and they have a thousand uh, useful samples each. So post, post burn in samples. Um, so then we have 4,000 basically parameter estimates right, a thousand per chain. And so what you do is you put those all into one, we can think about, I'll put it, they're collecting uh, old household appliances outside. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so you'd have, you'd have a, a 4,000 rows, I'm thinking of it in the data frame, you'd have 4,000 rows in a data frame. You'd basically um, sort uh, on that, the parameter value the estimated parameter, the draw from the posterior, right? So you'd have like the smallest of all the 4,000 would have rank one, and you'd have the highest estimate would have rank 4,000. So you'd kind of organize the, uh, you could organize the data frame that way. And then you kind of basically get rid of, I mean, you're gonna stop using the information of like what was the actual parameter estimate and just keep the, the rank. And then that's what the histogram is of for each for each uh, chain. So each chain will have its own histogram and what the histogram so, is of, go ahead. So it's showing, so it's, so, you've, so you've got a thousand, so your histogram goes up to 4,000 and you take one chain and that's gonna have a thousand values out of the one to 4,000 range. But then you divide the one to 4,000 range into buckets, however many into bins, and look at how many samples from each from your trace fall into that bin. Okay. That makes so, sense. Yeah, so, so I think the idea is then, so let's, again, just to keep things numerically simple, imagine that the bins are of size 100. Like, ideally, you know, it, it would be very suspicious if say like in the first three bins, only one of those chains like explored that lowest range, like you'd want right. um, all right. four and, of the chains. And if you had that, then the histogram would show that particular trace being really high and the others being really low in those bins. Exactly. So I, I think I think that's- Yeah, that makes sense. That's what it is. I do, I do know that when I look at those histograms though, I, I find that I don't like, I mean, it's because he hasn't shown one that looks bad, but to me, they just look like noise, which are maybe is the point. I think that's what it's supposed very, to look like. They Doesn't just look he, really stressful to me. He does have bad ones on page 291. All right, I got it. At the, at the top, figure 9.9. .9. All right, I'm very curious to see how I forgot what a bad trank looks like. Um, and it's exactly what you said. There's ranges, large There's ranges one. where one trace is on top uh, yeah. or on the bottom. I see. Yep, yeah, that's a... Uh... Yeah, so it's actually when they're when they're good looking, exactly what you said, Ken, when they're good, when they're good tranks, 
good drink plots. They look really chaotic and stress me out. And when they're bad ones, I feel like I understand what's going on. So, <laughs> so the degree of uncomfort, discomfort produced by a drink plot is a measure of how of how comfortable you should be with it. <laughs> yeah. The less comfortable they're, you are, the more comfortable you should be. Yeah, they're anti-correlated. Right. There we go. We've discovered <laughs> what that means. Uh, hopefully not. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, we can move on to the, the actual coding, I guess. So we can do medium one. Okay. Um, this, so this question is reestimate the terrain ruggedness model from a chapter, but now using uniform prior to the standard deviation sigma. The uniform prior would be this. It's actually not quite that in the BRMS. Um, does the different prior have any detectable difference influence different, I guess I need to go back and check that on the posterior distribution of sigma, why or why not? So I just copied and paste creating, this is creating this data, make it as a list. Um, let's see. So you can see the various priors. Now this is, so it's kind of interesting here is this is how um, you set it up. And I'll kind of get into that a little bit later with the hard problem. This NL means uh, equals true. And this is basically saying like this variable is uh, a function of an index based on how the data is structured. And then this is the difference you're taking that standardized. So it's kind of interesting because we already standardized it right up here. Um, so I don't know why, I don't know why they're just doing the standardized and then manually subtracting from the mean, but whatever. Um, so this is uh, a model, and then you can specify that the class coefficient, um, and notice that even the, the A, right, is, which is our intercept, we have zero for the global intercept, and this is a kind of the lower level of that nonlinear model, then we have these various priors, and then we're going to kind of change it up here and just say a uniform uh, zero one. So what we get here is this is um, everything converges okay. Um, so we have, I think CID one is for the African nations. And yes, and then this is non African nations, if you recall that. So we have different um, intercepts and then we have different slopes. Um, this is for, uh, let's see, African nations. So it's a positive. Um, and then this is for non-African, so the negative relationship. Notice, interestingly, that we do have um, our confidence intervals here, right? We This one is certainly within, but this one could include zero. It's the tail end, but something to be aware of. So we get this, which is the same, um, about the same value as before. So here's what I said. The estimate of sigma has not changed despite the less informative and unrealistic prior. It may have taken longer for convergence. So it's probably because there was enough data and effective sampling to get an estimate of sigma despite the lack of good prior information. So that was what I found. If anybody else tried it, I'd be curious to see if you found something different, especially if you um, if you use like the ULAM or whatever the packages that he recommends, which by the way, is not available. I'm using R 4.1.0 and uh, it is not available for this version of R. So. Oh, mm -hmm. what, uh, rethinking is not? Rethinking oh, is, but there's also an Ulam package, which I stupidly was trying to install it. Oh. And it was like, it's not available. So I could have used rethinking. I'm really trying to use BRMS more because it's tidyverse compatible. And I don't know, I feel like rethinking is kind of a, no offense to the rethinking package. It's got some good functions, but it's a little bit of a toy kind of package. It seems like um, for the purposes of the book, like an illustrative kind of package. Um, and there's like a lot of stuff out there for BRMS, lots of help forums. <laughs> As I discovered when I went through the hard three question, <laughs> looking for how to specify um, the formula, so. Yeah. Uh I did it with ULAM if you want to see. I got sure. basically the same results. I've been avoiding the BRMS because really? okay. it's um just the because the notation is mysterious to me. It is though. It, I 
I'm going to co complain about that here in a few minutes. So. And the Ulam stuff, it's like, okay, yeah, it's it's maybe simplified for tutorial purposes, but that's why I'm here. So yeah, that's true. That's you know, I can understand. You know, I can understand what the model is saying, and that all seems like a good thing. I mean, let well, me. Yeah, and I think. Yeah, if you want to share your screen, that'd be cool. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Richard yeah. McElrath mentions BRMS in this chapter, and he's like, it kind of, in his opinion, it kind of can obscure like what's going on or something. So I was like, oh, well, here I've been using yeah. it for the past weeks. It's, I think it's designed for people who know the LME4 package, which is okay. a non Bayesian, very popular non Bayesian multi level modeling package. Gotcha. And I think BRMS is using the same notation for specifying the models. So if you're you know moving from LME4 to BRMS, it's like, oh yeah, great. Now I'm yeah now I'm doing Bayesian and I don't need to learn how to respecify models. But if you're just trying to learn it from scratch, it's like this looks way more complicated than I really care to bother with. Um, yeah. So this is the ULAM model from just directly from the book, just really mm -hmm. copied from their code. And yeah. it's, it's really simple. I actually haven't, haven't looked at this recently, but it's basically saying, you know, mu is the intercept plus the, um, the slope with the same offset. Um, and for that gives this output here for a mean standard deviation. So standard deviation 0.1 and varying between, or, or the sigma, the mean of the sigma is 1.11, and it varies between 0.1 and 0.12, so very narrow. Then if I change um, sigma to be uniform, that's, mm -hmm. I printed these out in opposite, or it gives almost exactly the same results. It's interesting. Yeah, that lower, yeah. Um, and this is for change, so it should be, yeah, I think it should actually be 4,000, right? Because the default is a warm up of a thousand and mm -hmm. sample a thousand. That would be, let's see, the, no, 2,000. I have two, because there's 2,000 samples. I guess it, anyway, mm -hmm. then I wanted to just plot, do density plots of them. So I extract um, samples from both of them. And because this is the true Bayesian, not the quadratic approximation, this is just the actual. Um, samples from the Monte Carlo simulation and then plot them. And they're pretty similar. And I thought it was interesting that one of them has a dip in it, but when I repeated it, the dip was in the other one. So mm -hmm. I think that's just an artifact of um, how the random numbers worked out. And not yeah. So they're, they're pretty much the same. I mean, I could actually run it again if you want, just to compare. It's pretty quick. Sure. That, that, yeah, the M91 one, actually, that's too perfect to me. I'm suspicious. Like, that's like a theoretical well, distribution. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it is. But we'll see if they, if they reverse again. But I guess that's what also happens when you, uh, when one uses a um, geom density. So this is, I mean, it's, all right, so they change there. are a thousand. So there's 2,000 actual samples. So that, um, mm -hmm. The NF, it is bigger. So we ought to look at the autocorrelation in these things and see what it says, but not right now. Because that's would tell, maybe tell us what anti correlation is, since we have more effective samples than actual samples. You know, while this runs, one thing that I actually like about the. Oh, it's almost the same now, 2680. Sorry. <laughs> also, the. Now the yeah. nine point one is not quite as perfect. And then mm -hmm. the nine one a is the one that looks almost perfect, except a little bit mm -hmm. of wiggles. So it's just statistical variation. Yeah. I guess I could tell it to do more samples. Um, it might be interesting. Do that. Um, I don't know how to do that offhand. But Remember one one thing. Sampling. I think if you do, um, I don't, well, I actually, I don't know for Ulam. I was going to say, I have an idea for other, <laughs> for the PRMS, but I don't know. Yeah, we just put an iter argument in here. We could say here equals 2000 maybe, and 
maybe leave the warm up as um, is there a way to specify the warm up? Maybe is it two thousand already the default? No, or it's no? one thousand. Oh, one thousand. Okay, um, gotcha. Yeah, let me make this bigger. Here, um, and by default it does half of that. But how do I change that? Well, you know, one thing that you can do is know. go ahead, go ahead and run just that. Just do it. Yeah. There's, there's one um, question that I don't think anyone signed up for, which is asking us to specifically change the warm up. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And and see how that changes the effective number of uh, of samples. Oh, believe me, I've been trying to change for my problem. I was changing all kinds of warm ups. Yeah, I think I skipped that one because I was just like. I've played around with warm up stuff in other chapters. Yeah, that's yeah. a good, interesting question. Do you, do you remember the results of those? Experiments oh gosh, or? it was um, obviously oh, the more go. iterations you do, the better. I mean, even if you have a really tough distribution, generally you will eventually get there. Generally, um, I'm trying to remember. I think increasing warm up does help somewhat. But I felt like the number of iterations was really kind of, kind of the, the big the big determinant. Uh, it's been a few weeks though. <laughs> oh wow! Look at how ma those match really closely. Yeah, it's closer. Mm -hmm. What are the effective sample sizes on those? Oh, let's see. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, and then much yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit lower. Four thousand actual samples. Yeah, definitely quite a bit lower though for the yeah. one with the uniform prior. Yeah, which I guess it's not surprising. I'm trying to think if I have an intuition for why why those would be more correlated or less anti-correlated. <laughs> I don't know if I do. I I mean. <laughs> I think just because it's having a harder time finding useful values. Yeah, because the uniform distribution between zero and one is very constraining, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I guess maybe we should move on to the harder ones since people put in hard sure. work doing those. I will say just as a last thing, I looked in an older copy of the book and in the older copy, he, instead of having or maybe, in, I don't know if it's instead of or in addition to a, a uniform over zero one, he asked us old former readers to do uniform zero to 10. Mm. And so just for the fun of it, I did I did all three. I did the exponential the uniform zero one and the uniform zero 10, and they all produced the same. Yeah. Plot, which is probably unsurprising. So um, the moral of the story is if you keep using enough iterations and you have a good enough yeah. data set, you'll get there. Yeah, that's the main thing. There's enough data. It's on 234 observations, is that right? No, 170. Yeah. OK. All right, what's next? Did anybody do any other mediums? I only did uh, the one. I did. I started uh, medium two, but I don't have anything interesting. But I do think we should probably go to the hard ones because we, right. we're, we're capable of being very loquacious, I think. And uh, yeah. Hey, you know, we're just exploring all the little ins and outs. Uh, would you all mind if I did the hard three first? I have to leave like right at oh. a little before two just because I, I'm leading a meeting. So oh, yeah. I got it. I got to be there on time. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we have yeah. managed to fill the time pretty well, huh? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's how it's there, Oh, maybe I did do medium too. Oh, or no, maybe I can't remember. It's all running together. Okay. Can you make uh, your, your right panel smaller? so that Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Good um, point. Wrap so much. Yeah. So yeah, getting all these different divergent transitions, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay. Uh, okay, so this is the one that gave me a lot of grief. Uh, sometimes changing a prior for one parameter has unanticipated effects on other parameters. This is because when a parameter is highly correlated, 
another parameter in the posterior, the prior influences both params. Go back to the leg length example in chapter six and use the code there to simulate height and leg length for 100 individuals. So I just went to the BRMS guide and this is what they had. Um, and I'm trying, oh yes. And then he also talks about um, in this context for hard, the hard three, there's a initial list, right? Um, an, an initial list for both, uh, for all these different parameters, right? So this is uh, how they recommend doing it um, in the VRMS. Uh, apologies to those of you who are using rethinking. It's actually a lot simpler in rethinking, <laughs> as you all have pointed out. You just name intercept as 10. You could have a, for different chains, right? So if I wanted to, I could try different starting levels of the intercept for leg, leg, left leg, right leg, et cetera, sigma. So then he recommends just putting it into like a list where you just repeat it four times if you're going to do the same, uh, you know, the same starting for each chain because we're doing the four chains here. So then this model, of course, um, using the BRMS syntax is there's our intercept, left leg, right leg, all our priors there. And um, so we have the intercept, right, about 0.98. Um, <laughs> leg, these, of course, highly correlated, crazy um, standard errors, right? Left leg, right leg, it's very hard to measure. It's about both of them together, the coefficients are about two. Other than that, and we're having trouble with um, chains converging, I believe. Sigma is 0.63, so just kind of keep those in mind. Um, okay, so then this is where it gets interesting, speaking of. So he says to go back, and now what we're going to say is we're going to change the prior for the coefficient on the right leg so that it is strictly positive. Uh, so it's very easy, of course, in this rethinking package, he gives you exactly the uh, syntax. Of course, I had to torture myself with BRMS because I didn't want to give up. And so now we've got this nonlinear model. And this is, okay, so first I will say this, if you, there's the coefficient, right? You think um, field in these prior statements, you think you should just be able to say coefficient equals left leg, you know, or leg, leg right or whatever or like left, I guess, is the one that has the lower bound. Uh, no, like right. Um, no, you can't specify a lower bound with a coefficient in BRMS. So uh, that means you have to have a bunch of work around where you create a nonlinear model for something that really, in my opinion, doesn't necessarily need to be nonlinear. So how we do this is I'm saying intercept here. I'm going to use my same initial list, right? So I have that intercept variable um, and I'm calling this intercept. It is class B though now, the same prior. And then I have LL and LR. Now these are non-intercept because I didn't want to have any additional like intercept thing going on there for based on like left and like right. And then of course, nonlinear equals true. So I've got the same priors the same initial statements. Um, and I set the lower bound LB is that syntax for zero. Well, <laughs> look at how many iterations I was doing. Wow. Um, yeah, so I had a little bit of problem with this. <laughs> I was like max three def 15, adapt delta 0.95. The last thing I finally got was increase adapt delta above 0.95, which I never got around to doing. Maybe I will to see if it changes anything. But this is kind of interesting. So I get a lot of divergent transitions going back to our uh, our uh, little warning messages. So then I have this little comment on uh, the efficient way. There's not really an efficient way to do this. Somebody else asked this question and it was like, yeah, here's a workaround. Nothing really, that was like five years ago. I haven't seen anything changed. Okay, so let's take a look at, this is the, B6 point, let me draw this up here so it's easier to see. This is the last thing it came up with, um, trying a bunch of iterations. Um, you can see the intercept, intercept, and that's because this is a nonlinear 
Well, no, 0.97. So it's really kind of within the same. Look at sigma, basically the same too, right? Um, so these did. And then, but the interesting thing is, <laughs> remember how I mentioned before that leg right and leg left, they both added up to two, the coefficient. Well, we still see that same behavior, but now because we've imposed this lower bound of zero on leg right, we're getting some crazy, crazy stuff going on where we have the length of your left leg is negatively correlated with your height. Mm -hmm. not believable. <laughs> so um, yeah, maybe don't specify lower bounds for when you have a lot of uh, basically practically perfect multicollinearity, maybe is the moral of the story. So any comments anybody has on that? Um, well, first, thank you. That was a valiant effort on your part. Um, yeah, that makes me want to try the one from the book. Yeah, try it with the rethink. I'm sure you're going to have like a lot of my efforts were trying to get that, figure out the syntax to make that work. And I think just using the ulam function is a better way to go. So, yeah, I, I wonder. So, I thought it was kind of an interesting one. Like, um, you know, previously, whenever we wanted to um, specify that something should be non negative we've used just a different distribution, right? Mm -hmm. So like we could have specified a prior that was log normal mm -hmm. or an exponential uh, and that has zero prior mass below zero. So that's gonna have zero posterior mass below zero. So, yeah. so I don't, so it's, it's kind of weird to me to see just him being like constrained. Cut off, yeah. Which, well, if which, you want, I, I can plot this, uh, I can plot this. It's kind of interesting to see. You can see these like really flat distributions. And then let's see here. Oh, it's going crazy. Why is that taking so long to plot? Well, let's hopefully it'll load here. But yeah, you it, it it this distribution is worth looking at because it's so here's our leg right. <laughs> right, you got this like cut off here. So it's almost like yeah. this is kind of this is skewed now because this is skewed That's right. This is like skewed left because yeah. they both they kind of need to add up to yeah, I do exactly because that correct multi thing. So when you constrain one to be positive, the other one is going to be essentially constrained to be negative. Yeah, because we can't identify the coefficients separately. We know they add up to around two, but you know. <laughs> so yeah, mm -hmm. and then the chains. Interestingly, though, the chains all these iterations probably because I did so many, seem to mostly-ish converge. It's pretty small, um, but I mean, there were a few divergent transitions. So, yeah. What What's going on in that output? It looks like there's like a, and, and the chains, like maybe it's, I don't know if it's my screen or if it's it might be my screen, something. yeah. But just like, what is that baby <laughs> blue middle? I don't know, and I, I need to figure out how to get that. Maybe that's something related to the divergent transitions. And that might be something I can play around with and see if I figure that out. Uh, but yeah, it's like, are they converging? It's just like a mass of, because this, yeah, it's going, I don't know. Yeah, I should export it and see. I don't know. I'll, I might play around with that. Let you guys know if I see anything, figure out what's going on with that. Or if any of you guys want to do this problem and see what you find. So. I mean, I actually, I did do this. This is one of the ones that, okay. we that I accidentally did. Uh, yeah, what did you I, find? Uh, it's basically the exact same thing. I can share one. Um, yeah, sure. Oh, I can't. Oh, there you go. Now I can. Um, so I guess you can see my screen now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so it's basically the same thing. So here's VR. I do like that you can use um, the pairs function. Yeah, you can't use that on the VRMS output, which is a negative for that. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so so here there's this one, this perfect, this the scatter plot mm -hmm. shows you know the perfect negative correlation, negative one correlation. 
at first I do remember because I wasn't thinking about that they had up had to add up to two. So I was kind of worried that BL has quite a bit of mass that's non negative. Sorry, mm -hmm. non sorry that it has a lot of positive stuff. So I remember that oh BR has to be positive. So yeah. I in my head I was like, oh so BL has to be negative. But then I remember that that's not the case. So I, I felt better about that. Um because they have to add up to two. So anything here that's below mm -hmm. two needs to have some contribution from BL. So I was like, oh, okay. Anyway, the point is that it, it's the same graph that you got, Laura, or the same- I like this better though. It's a lot, the visual is, visual is better than the just simple plot. It is. I, I, and one thing that I had never noticed before, because I don't really use like GG pairs or pairs mm -hmm. just in general, is that they actually encode the magnitude of the correlation uh, into the size of the font, which I thought was was funny. I guess Ooh. I've never I, I've never had something before where most color correlations are basically zero and then one is maximum. But so here you see this is a huge negative one and then everything else is tiny, which hey Justin, have you tried calling trace plot on your models? Because I'm wondering if that would give us a better view of those chains and what's going on. Uh Okay. Went to that bluish, grayish, whatever we were seeing on my screen. Let's see. Yes, I called it and. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> it is yeah. slow. Seems to be pretty slow. I. Oh. But so maybe we can we can move on um, yeah. uh, and I'll let you know if this ever stops running. I have trace plots of those because I've just been running it while we're talking. Maybe the fact that you're sharing on Zoom or uh, Justin, that might be it. I don't know. Maybe. That's a bit weird. But uh, all right. So I think there's... Kent, did you have a... You signed up for a hard I one, did hard right? one, yeah. Um, let's see. Let me find that. Yeah, what it was. Oh, yeah. This is kind of fun. Um, it's... Uh, all right, let me share my screen again. So the question here was to run this model. I, I'm not, I haven't, haven't copying the questions in because of, I don't know, John Harmon's nervousness about copyright, I think. But it's to run this model and say, what is it doing? Um, so it's just sampling from the normal and Cauchy distribution since there's no, there's no constraints here. It's not telling to do anything. And um, see, I think I've thrown away the plots, but I probably still have the. And so, actually, no, is the trace plot that was more interesting. So this is this is pretty fun. I think the Cauchy distribution is is pathological. It has no mean or standard deviation. And the reason for that is because it has a lot of probability mass arbitrarily far out in the tails. Um, that I read the one description, one definition of it that made sense to me is it's the distribution of the intercept on the x-axis of a line projected from a point above the origin with a, a uniformly distributed angle. So if the angle is uniformly distributed, it's going to get out to infinity pretty with pretty good free, um, probability. And you can see that here. So this is the trace plot for the um, A, which is normal 0, 1. So it's kind of like what you'd expect. It's got a mean of 0. And it's sort of centered around 0. And it doesn't it get any bigger than basically plus and minus three standard deviation, plus and minus three, which is three standard deviations. Whereas the Cauchy distribution, first of all, this scale is completely different. This is minus 100 to 50. So <laughs> it's like la -di da very nice around zero. And then every once in a while it says, I think I'm gonna go off to the, to the moon for a minute and come back. <laughs> and that's what it does. So here it's going down to minus 100 and up to plus 50 and greater. Um, so that's what it's doing. And it just shows that the Cauchy distribution can have arbitrarily large values with significant probability and yep, they show up. So that's 
that's all I've got for that. Nothing particularly deep, but I thought it was kind of fun to see. That is interesting. Now, the y equals one, is that just basically saying y is a, I mean, it's I think constant it's just, or just you have to specify that, something I think there? Have, that's what I think because y doesn't appear anywhere in the actual yeah. model. Whereas, you know. That's not even a formula, really. Yeah. Here, you know, that slim would ha has this log GDP standard and um, you know the rugged standard. These parameters appear in the in the data, and here the, there's no parameters, so it's just estimating these with no constraints. Is my interpretation of it? Um, yeah. Saying okay, I'm not giving you anything to settle this down, so just show me the prior. Basically, if, yeah. if you take the prior and you don't have any um, any likelihood then your posterior is the same as the prior. Because my that makes my sense. question, I guess, would be, do you think, do either of you think that that's the equivalent to just doing R norm and like R Cauchy? Yeah, basically. Although I wonder how many effective samples we got. I saw that it was less for Cauchy. By the way, yeah. I, Laura has to leave like right now. Yeah, so. oh. yeah I will right. head out. Okay, so. bye, thanks. Yeah, good, yeah, good to talk to you guys. Week. Onward and upward, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. See ya. Bye. See, see both Bye. of you next week. See ya. Bye.